Good morning. We're the Clays. This is Beth. I'm Leonard. Today's reading from God's Holy Word is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 27. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the one body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, does that make it any less a part of the body? And if the ear says, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Merry, Merry Christmas! Christmas. Emmanuel! God with us! Emmanuel, God with us. That is the, uh, the sermon series, the Christmas series that we are finding ourselves 75% of the way through. Emmanuel, God with us. And... Of course, we know that he was with us in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so we have the manger uh, reminding us of the reason. And I, I, I almost hate this phrase just because it's, it rolls off the tongue so easily it almost becomes trite. But he is the reason for the season. We really would not have Christmas if it weren't for Christ. And we who uh, celebrate Christmas uh, often run the danger of forgetting that in the midst of all the hubbub. And so we began our Christmas series with uh, looking at how Jesus Christ was with us in the flesh as a true human being. And he remains fully human and fully God even now and forevermore. So Emmanuel, God with us, he was with us. He is with us. And we talked about that as the Holy Spirit. We are with each other in Him here in the church, and then we will be with Him forever in heaven. So here we are in week three of our Christmas series. The first week we looked at how Jesus becoming flesh truly and eternally God and man allowed for the purpose of His incarnation, His death, His resurrection. And of course, if we take away His humanity, we take away His effectiveness as a sacrifice on our behalf. Therefore, when, when we say that God was with us, it doesn't just mean he was somewhere nearby, but he became fully human without relinquishing any of his godness. And in becoming completely human, he was truly with us by being tempted in every way that we are, suffering the travails and the tribulations of the world, suffering grief and sickness, exhaustion, betrayal. But he also experienced many of the joys of life in God's creation, little children and, and good meals and and wedding celebrations, and lifelong friendships, and the salvation of loved ones. He was with us completely, and now he stays with us in his humanity, and by giving us his Holy Spirit. And that was a subject that Pastor Chad tackled last week. The fact that God is still with us. He indwells every believer as the Holy Spirit, and in so doing enables us to live lives far superior to the hopeless and ultimately futile life of a non-believer. And if you haven't checked it out yet or you weren't here last week, I cannot encourage you strongly enough to visit our website or find the video on YouTube and hear what the Lord said through Pastor Chad last week. 
For our fourth installment of the series, we invite and we encourage you each, uh, those who are here in person and those over the internet, to join us Friday evening for our annual Christmas Eve Eve service here at uh, at Creekside at 6.30. That night will be an evening full of wonder and worship, old and familiar songs and old and familiar faces, along with the joy of new songs and new faces. We will also be delving into what may seem slightly unchristmassy, because we are going to tackle that night the final stage of Emmanuel, God with us, and that is the hope-filled fact that we who have placed our trust in Him will go to be with Him forever. You really won't want to miss it. In the meantime, we find ourselves looking at how God with us in the person and work of Jesus of Nazareth means that we, His followers, are with one another in an amazing and impossible way that far transcends mere common interests or, or uh, shared hobbies. You see, the world can rally around and find camaraderie in those things. But only in Jesus Christ are we joined together in eternal bonds. Don't get me wrong, we're not just bonded in eternity. Even now, here in this life, we are connected through Christ in ways that are life-changing for us and impossible for the lost. So we'll get started with a word of prayer. And then we'll get into our message this morning. Lord Jesus, we celebrate your birth, for in doing so we celebrate that you, God eternal, became man, and and man you eternally remain. Help us to celebrate well, for your incarnation led us to your death, which leads us to life, which we can live to your glory because of your Holy Spirit. May our lives be so joined to one another that we recognize our inseparability our unity, our common purpose. And then, Lord, let that play out in our common life until you call us home or come to get us. Help us to remember that Emmanuel didn't stop being your name when you went back to heaven, but you are and will forever be God with us. Be with us as we explore your word this morning. Speak to your people through me, though I deserve no such honor. Accomplish your will in this place and in our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. So we are with one another in Christ. That's a nice phrase, a wonderful sentiment. It could make a pretty decent Christmas card, couldn't it? We are with one another in Christ. And you send it to someone that you love that's far, far away, and it's like a Christian version of I'll be home for Christmas. If only in my dreams. What does this really mean? That we are with one another in Christ. I could have chosen a number of passages to have the Clays read for this morning's video. I obviously landed on 1 Corinthians 12. But if we're going to understand the unity of the body of Christ, we need to look beyond any one single passage. And in fact, I'm going to start discussing the unity of the body of Christ by going to the Old Testament, to the very beginning of the Old Testament. To Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 25. And in this passage, God creates and describes what a human relationship should be like. Perfect unity. Fearless of being seen. Caring for one another as if of one body. And yes, I know that God was creating marriage. But it also serves as, as an example of what those who have no sin ought to look like in relationship to others who have no sin. And before you say, well, yeah, that's great, but I've I've got plenty of sin, and some of the people in my row have even more, and I'd like to point them out to you right now. Don't do that, but allow me to remind you, if you are a Christian, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, your sin has been removed. Amen. Amen. By the blood of Jesus Christ, it has forgiven, no sin imputed, uncondemned and uncondemnable people. This does serve as a model for those in the local church. This passage here in Genesis describes how we ought to be because we are once again in a right relationship with God. He does walk with us, not just in the cool of the evening, but he who, who walked with them in the cool of the evening lives with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. And there is no sin between us because it has been removed from every believer. 
And so when you look at Adam and Eve and you think, oh man, what must that have been like? The answer should be to look around your local body of believers and say, oh, this is what that's like. Now, how many of you think we live in a perfect church with perfect relationships just like the Garden of Eden? Anybody? No, we, we, we clearly do not. I said this is a model for us in the local church. It, it is a standard. It is something for which we ought to strive. But we are fallen human beings. And until the Lord perfects us, then we will continue to have issues between one another. Nevertheless, what God desires for his people and what we will someday have in heaven is the Eden-like pre-fall relationship of Adam and Eve between every believer forever and ever. And boys and girls, that is something to look forward to. The next passage I would turn to if I were to you know, give a sermon on the unity in the body of Christ would have to be Ephesians chapter 4. Now, I would encourage you, please, to read all of Ephesians chapter 4 this week. And if you're watching on the internet at home, pause right now and read all of Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read some excerpts aloud, and they'll be on the screen, but don't think for a minute that I'm skipping unimportant parts. I am merely zooming in on the passages within the larger passage that specifically address our attitudes and our behavior towards other believers. That's what we're looking at here in Ephesians chapter 4. But all of Ephesians 4 is really where uh, the Lord describes the relationship we ought to have. We'll start with verses 1 through 6. Paul writes, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, maybe, just maybe, I'm the only one who's had this experience, but we used to go to some extended family on Christmas Day, and that particular branch of the Perry family tree was known to have an occasional dispute. And so it fell to my dad more than anything else, though sometimes he was the, the one that would instigate it just to get him riled up. But it often felt like we had to be the ones who lived this way. You know, we're going to walk worthy. Now, when your cousins are obnoxious, be a good example to them, I would hear. When the uncles are yelling and fighting and drinking and cussing and doing all this stuff, don't be like them. Be good. And so I think at the holidays, we often put this passage into practice in our families, but we often forget this passage in our church family, don't we? Because here Paul and the Holy Spirit through Paul is not talking about when you gather with your relatives and they get a little rowdy. He's talking about when you gather with your eternal family. And we get a little rowdy. Verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all all. This is what tells us that he is clearly talking to believers only. This is the standard to which we are to, to live and how we are to treat one another. Jump down to verse 14. Paul describes all this. He says, why? He says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by uh, what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body to the edifying of itself in love. There's an awful lot in there. I'm just going to go ahead and jump down to verse 30 where he continues to tell us how to live in community with other believers and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. You want to know what it means to have Christian unity? 
to be, as our sermon title declares, truly with one another in Christ, it's hard to find a better description than Ephesians chapter 4. It tells us how we ought to live, the attitude we ought to have, the words we ought to use. It's all there. But then again, that was pretty wordy. And I even skipped some passages just to zoom in on that. And we're Americans, right? We want things neat and tidy and immediately gratifying with as little work as possible and in as few words as we can, right? That's how we want things. And the Holy Spirit obliged when he had Paul write his letter to Philippi. So flip from Ephesians over to Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, where the Holy Spirit through Paul says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, if you have any of this, any at all, he says, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let me pause there for just a moment and say this. Repeatedly, he says, any, 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 any. You say, well, yeah, but I don't, I don't have complete consolation in Christ. I don't have absolute full comfort. Sometimes I'm a little uncomfortable in love. I, fellowship, well, you know, we eat together sometimes. We're Baptists, so fellowship means food. But he's not saying, are you completely full of all of these? He says, if you can find even a little tiny bit of it towards one another, then if you have even a little bit of it, it should lead you to like-mindedness, same love, one accord, one mind. Paul is not describing here the perfect church that you have to then come into and put on your mask and act perfect like everybody else. He says, look, if you have any consolation in Christ, any comfort in love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection, any mercy, be these things. Well, you say, that's great, but how exactly are you supposed to do that? Verse 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit but in lowliness, humility of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Now, that's a dangerous word right there, too. It's, it's, it's really a bad translation in English. This is not saying walk around, everybody's better than me. No, we do enough of that garbage. That's not what Paul is saying here. He says, put them first. Put them first. Get out of yourself. Get out of your selfish bubble. Look beyond yourself and say, you know what? It is far more important that I serve my brothers and sisters in Christ than that I get all my wants fixed. Because when we stop being consumer Christians and start being servant Christians, our attitude changes swiftly and completely. When we as fathers stop bellyaching about every inconvenience that we have, Stop shoving, well, I work hard for all these things down our wife's throat. When we start to say, my only and sole purpose is to serve my family, guess what? All the other things that you've been worried about disappear or are solved. Paul's not saying, walk around going, everybody's better than me. No, he's saying, treat them as if their holiness is, their comfort, their love for Christ is your highest goal. And in so serving, you will reach your goal as well. He continues, let each of you look out not only for his own interests. He's not saying ignore yourself. Look out for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Now, this too is a picture of what it means to be with one another in Christ. And as the next few verses show, this this is all rooted in Christ. It's what happens when we follow his example. It is the natural outpouring of a life spent with Christ as Lord and Savior. And so I dare say to you today, what is described in these two chapters, Ephesians 4, Philippians 2, are not only possible, but they are inevitable. If a group of Christians are truly in relationship with Jesus Christ and each other. You want to fix dysfunction in your church? Pursue Christ. Serve one another. 
the route to fixing problems in your church or your family or your marriage is not to point out all their flaws. It's to serve them. To stop looking down in your, in your, in your naval inspection and to say, what I want, my comfort is less important than my holiness. And if holiness means Christ-likeness, then I've got to get off my high horse and down on my knees to scrub the feet of the filthy people that have been kicking me all week long. That, Christians, leads to an inevitable unity in our church. How do I say that? Because it's what God intends. It's what He has given His Holy Spirit to accomplish. It is the natural and the supernatural result of becoming more like Jesus Christ. Is it easy? No. Is your pastor even good at it? No. Chad's not that great. I mean, I'm good, but the other path, no, I'm okay. It's not easy. Did God ever promise that following him would be easy? Did God ever preach the prosperity gospel of come to me, write me big checks, and I'll make sure your life is cozy? No, he said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I overcame the world. Well, how did he overcome the world? Because the world threw absolutely everything it had at him, and he squished it, and now everything in the world kneels before him, including us. Did God promise following him would be easy? No. Is it messy and inconvenient and risky to have this kind of community? Yes. Is it worth the sacrifice? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, yes. A thousand times over, yes. The unity of the body of Christ is absolutely worth any price you have to pay. How do I know that? Because my Savior, Jesus Christ, paid the ultimate price. He paid a far greater price than we are even capable of paying, and He did it that we might be one in Him and with Him. And if it was worth it for Him to leave heaven, live a crappy life here on a fallen earth, die the worst and most horrible death that has ever been invented by man, then yeah, I think it's worth whatever cost may come our way. Now, on the other hand, having now gone to Scripture to describe how we ought to live in Christ and the relationship and unity that ought to be ours, we flip to the other side of the coin. And I can easily pick a hundred different passages that describe how easily this kind of community can be shattered by those who sow dissent, by those who gossip, by those who have their selfish desires, by those who twist Scripture to fit themselves rather than conform themselves to Scripture. I could cite passage after passage and say, don't do this and don't do this and don't do this. But I've chosen to read only one of those passages today because it's Christmas. And we're celebrating the unity of the believer, not condemning those who would destroy it. Nevertheless, I think it behooves us to take at least a quick look at how easily those who seem to be in the body of Christ can destroy the unity that we're supposed to enjoy. And so I jump to the book of Jude. Jude verse 4. By the way, there's no chapter in Jude. It's one chapter book. It's an incredible book. Wonderful, wonderful book. Jude verse 4 says, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Jump down to verse 10. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. They've run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. They've perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. A wise preacher once said to me, 
when you're preaching, remember you're feeding the sheep, not hunting wolves. This is not a tree stand. It is a pulpit. And I've never forgotten that, but I have at times ignored it. And every time I've ignored it and gone wolf hunting from the pulpit, thinking, oh, that, there's, a, there's a wolf in sheep's clothing and I'm going to shoot him down right here. I've regretted it every time. Today is not that day. I'm here to feed the sheep, not hunt the wolves. Nevertheless, pay attention to what Jude says. These people creep in unnoticed. They attend the most intimate community building events in the church. Verse 12 says the love feasts. They're in the church. They're part of us. They're what we might call pillars of our community. They participate in all these things and they feel very comfortable doing so because verse 12 says they do it without fear. They think they belong. They seem to belong. They think they belong. They participate as if they belong, but they do not belong. Not really anyway. But if you read those passages or those verses out of Jude, you know that God at least goes easy on them. He doesn't seem to mind those who come in and try to destroy the church. He doesn't say anything too harsh to them, right? If anybody ever said to me the things that Jude says about these people, I think I'd be forgiven for punching them. These are harsh words. These are fighting words. And Jude says them under the inspiration, the perfect inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He speaks for God himself. And their condemnation is pretty harsh. And I think Jude learned how to verbally crush religious wolves in sheep's clothing from his oldest brother because they're both known to really tear into those who use religion to gain power, authority, influence, and personal comfort. By the way, his oldest brother was the baby in the manger. Jude is the child of Mary and Joseph, therefore a half-brother to Jesus. So, how do you know if you're an Ephesians 4, Philippians 2 kind of unity builder or a Jude 1 kind of wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, I can give you some helpful pointers, but then ultimately we're going to go straight to the Word of God for definitive answers. But the, the pointers I'm going to give you here come from the Word of God. These are my three helpful pointers to know if you're a unity builder or a wolf. Are you ready? Number one, look for fruit in your life and those around you. Are you producing the fruit of the Spirit that Pastor Chad spoke of last week in yourself and others? Are those around you more loving and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind and good and faithful and self-controlled because of you? Or are they unhappy, impatient, rude, naughty, wishy-washy, or out of control once you're done with them? Are you producing the fruit of the Spirit in yourself and in others? And if the answer to that question is no, then you certainly are not living the Ephesians 4, Philippians 2 life within the church. Now, am I, am I saying you have to be perfect? That if you've ever left somebody and they're a little crabby because you were there, you failed. No, no, no. I'm talking about a lifestyle. Do you leave destruction in your wake or do you leave the fruit of the Spirit, people feeling fed, having been in your presence? Second pointer for you. Ask someone who doesn't like you. If you can't name somebody, ask somebody. They'll find them for you. Your friends have learned to translate your foibles into fondness. Ask someone with no interest in tooting your horn what they see in you. Now, disclaimer, full, full warning here. This may cause and should cause deep reflection. Find out what those who don't like you don't like about you. And by the grace of God, what you'll hear is, well, you're just all full of that Jesus stuff. I can't stand it. You're holier than me. Yeah? All right. <laughs> Be proud, Christians. That's fantastic. You make me feel guilty because of how I live. I've heard variations of that for a long time. And I say, oh, I'm, 
I'm sorry I make you feel guilty. There's a solution to your guilt, and it's Jesus Christ. And after we have a conversation, I walk away going, (laughs) because those are badges of honor. But if somebody says, I don't know which one of your two faces I'm talking to, because the one you usually show me is not the one you show everybody else about me. You know, when, you, when you're in a room, it's just you make it all about yourself. And I just lose, make me feel small. These are the things that those who don't like you will share with you and make you deeply introspective. Look for fruit in your life and in those around you. Ask someone who doesn't like you what they don't like about you. And then thirdly, especially as far as it, it concerns your life here in the congregation. Analyze your social patterns while at church. Do you spend your time with people you know well? Or are you looking for opportunities to build friendships, unity with those people you don't? Are your friendships at church built around common traits and interests? Do you only talk to those of your generation? Do you who come in ties and dresses chat with other tie and dress people or do you go find the jeans and flip-floppers? When you greet new people, do you say, welcome, we're glad you're here? Or do you say, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Would you like to sit with us? You see, there's a huge difference between allowing someone in and inviting them in. We as a church are a friendly church. We're, we're very friendly. People walk out of here saying, oh, it, was, it was nice to, to talk to everybody. Everybody said hi. But I think while the grade has certainly uh, risen in my time here, we are still not where we want to be as far as being a welcoming church. We're friendly, but we have our little kingdoms, our little roles, and as long as you don't think you're like, you know, going to sneak into my place, I like having you here. But the body of Christ should be constantly looking for someone to pour into, someone to take our place, someone to work beside us. We ought to be building deeper friendships. Welcome, I'm glad you're here is a wonderful thing to say to someone. Would you like to come and sit with me is an entirely different thing. Even something as little sounding as do you wear your name tag? Knowing a name makes a person infinitely more approachable. Having this thing around your neck says I am interested in knowing and being known. As dumb as this sounds, this is a tool to build unity. And I encourage you to wear it. Finally, and although I could keep going, does your relationship with others in the church cause heaven to gasp in wonder? Sounds like a tall order, doesn't it? In in, in their book, Compelling Community, Where God's Power Makes a Church Attractive, Mark Deaver and Jamie Dunlop write this. They say, look at Ephesians 3.10. God's intent was that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. They write, consider a group of Jews and Gentiles who share nothing in common except for a centuries-old loathing for one another. For a less extreme modern-day parallel, think of liberal Democrats and libertarian Republicans in my own neighborhood or the disdain for the Prada shod fashionistas feel for the Schlitz swilling NASCAR crowd multiplied many times over, of course. Bring them together into the local church where they rub shoulders on a regular basis and things explode, right? No. Because of the one thing they do have in common, the bond of Christ, they live together in astonishing love and unity. Unity that is so unexpected so contrary to how our world operates that even the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms sit up and take notice. God's plans are amazing, aren't they? Do you understand 
There is no reason in the world that some of you should be friends with some of you. You have nothing in common. You got Packer fans and Bears fans sitting down at a table together. And if you can overcome that gap, my goodness. But it goes far deeper than that. We have Trumpers and never Trumpers. We have men and women. We have old and young. We have wealthy and less wealthy. We have people who are poor and people who don't know what it's like to wonder whether a bill gets paid. And yet, here in this building, in this body of believers, there's a unity that cannot be explained by this world. And I love it. I love this family because you have put up with me when you have plenty of reasons not to. And I have deep, lifelong, eternal friendships with people with whom I have no common interest other than the unity of Jesus Christ. And if your relationships here within your church family aren't amazing to you, how could they be amazing to the rulers in the heavenly places? The truth is, sticking within our comfort zones, keeping our masks up and our facades intact, building relationships based on mutual interests outside of Christ, spending more time picking apart others' shortcomings than celebrating their progress, these are the recipes for discontentment when we're called to amazing, awe-inspiring relationships of true intimacy and unity. We're called to relationships that blow our minds. And we settle for, oh, they look like me, they act like me, we like the same things, I'll hang out with them. Ah, brothers and sisters, there's more. There's more available and there's more evident in this body. Now, I said you have to have given you my three helpful pointers to know if you're a unity builder or a wolf in sheep's clothing. I would go straight to scripture for definitive answers and so I shall. Turn with me to the passage that was read earlier in the video. 1 Corinthians 12, and you'll see not only how to know if you're a good member of the body of Christ or if you are a cancer, but you'll also see how to become an even better, healthier, awe-inspiring organ within the body of Christ that he heads. We talk now about playing our part to build and build unity in the body of Christ. This week is Christmas, right? And I think I can speak for just about everybody when I say we don't like wasted gifts, right? Right? If I spend time, money, or energy providing something to someone that is intended to be a blessing and it's not a blessing, I just kind of wish I hadn't gotten them anything at all. You know I like socks, right? I've always got a different pair of socks. I like weird socks, I like fun socks. Until last week, I did not have, believe it or not, I had no Christmas socks. I got candy cane socks on today. They were a gift from a family in this church. And I want them to know that they were a blessing to me. And when I got them out this morning, I went, I have Christmas socks. And now I'm telling Gina, you're going to have to wash these socks before Friday because I'm wearing them to a Christmas Eve service, Christmas Eve Eve service, because they're a blessing to me. I'm going to wear these suckers out because they're useful. And I know right now, because I can see her, that she is smiling knowing that she has given me a gift that is used. It brought joy to my heart. And the rest of her family, Brenda, tell them what you got me. Um, when, uh, so. Wasted gifts make us wish we hadn't given anything at all. A friend of a, a, the great comedian, Phil Silvers, was trying to, to find a, a special gift for, for him. You know, the proverbial man who had everything And he was delighted, or she, I guess, was delighted when Silvers arrived for a weekend visit driving a Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud. She said, you don't need need that bus this weekend. Let me take it in for a checkup. And Phil Silver said, okay, fine. So his friend hastily arranged for the installation of a built-in bar and a hi-fi stereo and a color television set and a VCR. Now, this is a few years ago. But the Rolls arrived back just in time for Silver's Monday morning departure. And the friend and hostess says, well, you better check out before you you start off, Phil. Uh, Just make sure everything's 
in shape. Oh, that doesesn't matter, Phil Silvers replied. It's a rental. <laughs> now, that's funny, right? It might even be true, but Phil Silvers knows, and I don't, and no comedian ever let the truth get in the way of a good story. But here's the thing, so, here's the thing though, right? There is no such thing as a rented life, especially new life in Christ. The gifts that God has given every believer are not meant to go unused. They're not meant to be returned without opening. They're not meant to be sent off to the real owner of the life. Spiritual gifts are meant to be used until the day our life ends. And if we're not dead yet, we're not done yet. 1 Corinthians 12 comes right in the middle of Paul's most lengthy explanation of spiritual gifts, a topic that occupies at least chapters 12, 13, and 14, but I could argue it's, it's really at the heart of chapters 8 through 14 are all about spiritual gifts. And we don't have time today, nor does our topic demand it, to delve deeply into every nuance and every verse. I think we ought to take the time to see how it is that God has chosen to build unity in His body, the kind of unity that makes heavenly rulers take notice, the kind of unity, frankly, that Jesus came to earth to give us. Unity with God and unity with each other is one of the reasons the baby in the manger came. And in some ways, I could say it's the only reason he came. So out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find a need to play our part. Each and every part is important. You ever been to, the, been to a concert where the cymbal guy messed up? You know, the big pshh. I have. I've even been that cymbal guy back in junior high uh, crashed my cymbals at the wrong time, and believe me, everybody noticed. People lied right to my face. Oh, I didn't even know. Yeah, you did. Okay, <laughs> and it was, it was there. One great composer and conductor, Sir Malcolm Sargent, was once asked what he needed to know in order to play the cymbals. He says, nothing. You just have to know when. doesn't take a great deal of skill, although I will tell you, if you just smash them together, they stick, and that's embarrassing too. I've done that. <laughs> You don't have to know much. You just have to know when. The first step in understanding your importance in the body of Christ is to know that while some gifts may not seem that important, they are. And sometimes you don't have to know much about it. You just have to know when it's needed. The symbols don't seem that vital until they're being misused. Play them at the wrong time and it will ruin the entire performance. And if I was really, really good at it, I would maybe have taken like the 1812 overture and taken the cymbals out. And you'd hardly recognize the song. You take that out, it's like, well, hmm. how'd this song ever get famous? It may not seem that prestigious to be the cymbal guy, but if he or she fails to do their job, everything's ruined. Likewise, every Christian who doesn't use their gifts, who isn't serving the body, is detrimental to the whole body. In verses 23 and 24, Paul addresses the honorable and dishonorable parts of the body. A brief explanation of what Paul is saying here. We all have certain parts that we keep covered from casual view. Nevertheless, though these seem to be the least presentable parts of us, we hold them in a place of special honor. There is nothing that will make a man more cautious than to put his hidden parts in jeopardy. Likewise, few things will take an emotional toll on a woman greater than to have their special parts taken from them. But does having a vasectomy or a hysterectomy or a mastectomy or any other ectomy make you any less of a man or somehow no longer a woman? Absolutely not. But emotionally, the loss of the parts we keep hidden or the parts we cannot see take the greatest toll. And Paul here is saying, even parts we don't think are worthy of public display are vital to the health of the body. So it is with the body of Christ. Those who think they have nothing worth sharing are often the most vital to the proper functioning of the body of Christ. Some of you think that because you can't preach or teach that somehow you are worth less or have less to give than people like me. Wrong Give me a church full of only pastors and I will give you utter chaos. I was at a pastor's conference a few years ago and I don't remember the guy's name. I still see his face, but he said, pastors are a lot like fertilizer. 
You spread them out thin and everybody grows better, but you pile them up all in one place and they start to stink. It's absolutely true. On the other hand, give me a church full of only deaconesses or only custodians or only graphic designers or only pew fillers and I will give you the biggest mess to ever occupy a church building and that's saying something. Because a variety of gifts is the only plan of God and it's a good one. I am sorry to the entire world that this is kind of the face of the church. But it remains my prayer every single week that if somebody asks you, and you've heard this before, if somebody asks you, hey, who spoke at your church this Sunday? You say, God did. Oh, but he used James's voice or Chad's voice or Mitchell's voice or Gene's voice or whoever is up here saying the things of God. Have you ever felt like nobody wants to see my gifts? They're not important. They don't matter. It's better if I just keep them hidden. If so, verse 24 is for you. Do you understand that the less you think you have to give, the more God honors you? One caveat. God doesn't honor or appreciate those who think their gifts are not honorable and therefore don't use them. If you say, well, my my gifts are nothing. I'm not going to use them. God doesn't honor that. But he honors those who use their gifts with humility, far more than those who think they're somehow contributing what God couldn't live without. You ever hear somebody say, well, you know, God needed such and such. God needs me to... What paltry, pathetic, unbiblical God are you worshiping that needs you? God doesn't need you. You bring nothing except what he's given you. However... The plan of God, that needs your participation. God doesn't. Humility says, I am part of a bigger plan and I will play my part that the rest of the body doesn't suffer. Verse 24b, God composed the body having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. Now this one's straight, I'm shooting straight across the bow of all of you who think that somehow you don't have anything to bring to the table, anything to give, any way to serve. My gifts aren't important. We as Christians do not have the right to decide if we are worthwhile or if our gifts are useful. We do not have that right. The very fact that Jesus Christ put on humanity, became the baby in the manger, grew to be the man who taught us how to live, died to pay the ultimate price for us, defeated death on our behalf, removed our sins, sits at the right hand of our Father, calling us to become heirs with Him, should tell us our worth and value. The fact that He goes above and beyond that to give us spiritual gifts should tell us how badly He desires us to use them. And what does this have to do with unity? let alone Christmas. Well, it goes back to one of my earliest statements this morning. Emmanuel didn't stop being his name when Jesus went back to heaven, but he is and will forever be God with us. As the body of Christ, which is what the Bible often calls the church, we are with one another in Christ. Jesus is with me. Jesus is with you. We are both with Jesus. Therefore, we are with one another. And that means a bond that cannot be severed because the bond between Jesus Christ and his followers cannot and will not ever be broken. Jesus came to be with us when he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He lived with us for 33 years ish, then ascended to heaven to continue being with us as the head of our body. Remember spending some time in Ephesians 4 this morning? Ephesians 4.15 tells us that we are collectively growing up in all things into Jesus Christ, our head, who made and supplies all things to his body. Christmas is therefore a celebration of the unity of God and man, man and man, and man and God. As such, it is our job to both build and protect the unity that comes from pursuing Christ-likeness together. That doesn't end when the trees and the tinsel come down It'll end when the Son of God comes down. And then it really begins. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Psalm 133, as you know, because you wrote it through the pen of David, says, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, 
running down on the edge of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Unity is a precursor, a taste of eternal life. And we know that life forevermore began the moment we turned in faith to you. One of the greatest joys of that life is the unity of believers. Help us to foster it, not just when it's easy here at Christmas time, but to be intentional throughout the year to use our gifts, to make certain we're not wolves in sheep's clothing, to build unity by celebrating progress more readily than scrutinizing errors. Teach us to repent. Teach us to trust. Teach us to step outside our comfort zones and allow ourselves to be known even as you have revealed yourself to undeserving humanity. Above all, help us to grow up into you, our head. It is in your name that we pray this. Amen.